Hey, Whip. Hey, hey, JP. How you doing? Good, good, good. I got my full glass of water. Thank Fantastic. you very much. Fantastic. That's nice and cold. <laughs> yeah, there, there's a machine with a filter, so it's filtered, filtered as well. Neat. So today we're going to cover how to understand and how to assess a, a patient. Okay. And uh, we're going to go over this McHugh and Slavny model, or it's called the Perspectives of Psychiatry. And, uh, and then we might talk about it today or we might talk about it another time okay. around how to maybe, uh, maybe apply it. And so my, my mentor and uh, friend, Tim Guimond, he did his medical school in John Hopkins. Okay. And there are the, these two senior psychiatrists, McHugh and uh, Slavny. And what happens when, when you've been in a leadership role for a long time, you can just decide what happens in your organization and how it runs. And uh, they had their own approach to psychiatric assessment. So over here for us, you know, you'll see someone 45 minutes, you know, you go through the uh, identifying data, chief complaint, history of presenting illness, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But when they see a person, it's like for an hour and a half, and they find out the person's story from birth to present. Wow. They, they, that's how they do it. They do like an hour and a half uh, assessment from birth to uh, present. And, and the whole rationale behind that is that there's this real belief that within psychiatry and within medicine, We've gone from this bio, psycho, social, spiritual, cultural approach to like bio, bio, bio. What's going on biologically? What are you addicted to? What's your diagnosis? What's the medications? Et cetera, et cetera. So interesting compared to our talks about MI, which is sort of uh, Bill Miller often says that, you know, kind of the assessment part can be put into later on, right? You don't want to be loading people down with asking too many questions in the beginning because you may not get beyond that first session. So it's, yeah. that's not the time to be interrogating them for, for 90 minutes. Yeah, absolutely. And I think for our clinical environments, what I find is that the family medicine residents are very good at taking a complicated case and breaking it down into 10 minute chunks, you know, because that's what they do in real life, right? You know, they'll have someone that comes in with diabetes, hypertension, uh, I don't know what else, what else, like heart disease, whatever it might be. Uh, and instead of doing a full comprehensive assessment in one visit, they'll see somebody like four or five times and just do little chunks of it. And you can imagine for people that we see who use drugs that are either intoxicated or withdrawal or all those kinds of things, you have to have that skill set. But in psychiatry, we're not really trained for that. We're trained for somebody comes in and we're ready and they're ready for a comprehensive assessment. So, okay. so it's not just, um, it's just, it's just the way that we're, we're trained. Okay. And you'll get to a point with Bill Miller's patient when he works with them where they're like, okay, I'm ready to go, let's figure this out. Sure. And then maybe that's when he does the, the assessment. So you might do the MI for what you care about, what's important to you, all those kinds of things to get the person on board with coming in. And when the motivation's high, you can have them do like a full series of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You know, just like, uh, just like a student who's committed to a class and they're committed to showing up for 20 sessions as opposed to the person who's like, oh, I don't know if I want to take the course, I don't know if I want to sign up, all that kind of stuff. And so the assessment starts from birth to uh, present uh, and, and this model from McHugh and Slavny um, has really helped me understand people that I work with okay. and helped me decide what kinds of treatments do I think that they need. Um, one thing that, that Tim typically says before this, he'll, he'll say this quote from one of his uh, stats profs that all models are inherently wrong, some of them are useful. Right, and so when you present a model, I think, I think I think I've heard him quote that too. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think you've heard me quote that because uh, <laughs> that's one of the first things I say before I present this, because anytime you hear something new, you're going to be like, oh, it's not going to work for this, it's not going to work for that, all that kind of stuff, and I just want to make sure that your mind is primed to think about how um, it might be useful in some way. Okay. So with the dimensions model, they look at sort of four quadrants of the person. Right, so the first quadrant is disease. And if you had to think about disease, what kinds of things do you, do you think about? 
Well, you think about something where the cells aren't working properly. The, the firing of the neuron, the brain, all that stuff, it's not working up properly. And in medical illness, like if you have an infection or if you have heart disease, it's a little bit clearer. But for psychiatric illness, we would say, you know, things like, you know, schizophrenia, where you're hearing voices, bipolar disorder, where you're having manic or depression, severe depression, uh, dementia, the cells are, are not working up properly, delirium, where uh, uh, these all could be things where there's something medically broken uh, that needs to be fixed or corrected in, in some kind of uh, way. And from a psychiatric uh, perspective, there's certain things like, um, you know, hearing voices or mania where usually we strongly recommend treatment. And sometimes for treatment-resistant depression, people get to the point they need electroconvulsive therapy. Like they need something to shift up the way those cells are firing. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Okay, yep. so that's, that's one part. The second part is more That's the disease part. So the first group is disease, which is yeah. some... So, so the second part of the four quadrants is dimensional. And for any kind of trait any human has, you know, like you can almost put it around a normal distribution where uh, at the extremes there might be a problem and there's a whole spectrum. And, and there's a couple of things that you can imagine that would cause problems, right? So if you look at human height, right, uh, there's a normal distribution. But if you're at the extremes, you know, where you're maybe like seven feet uh, plus uh, tall, or you're four feet uh, tall, um, it's going to cause problems in your day-to-day -day life, right? Like, you sure. know, getting through doors, fitting into cars, driving, all that kind of stuff. Uh, the same thing can happen with uh, IQ as well, right? And so if you're quite low, like, say, below 80 uh, or 70, it might be hard to hold a day-to-day -day job. And, uh, and if you're really high, like, I don't know, like 180 or something, maybe you have no idea how to have social conversations. You're so, like, uh, your, your skill set is so uh, specialized. And so... In the psychological uh, research, um, they talked a lot about this five-factor model. Okay. And uh, when the DSM-5 was coming out, there was a whole bunch of psychology researchers that were saying, hey, you know what, your DSM personality disorder diagnosis is not consistent, everyone gives a different diagnosis, all that stuff, you need to shift to something more empirical. Um, but they, they weren't able to sort of win, right? Because, you know, it's been decades that these psychiatric diagnoses uh, have had some kind of clinical uh, utility. And so in the psychological literature, there, there's five uh, quadrants uh, or like ocean for the five-factor model. So openness to experience as opposed to being close to experience. Um, conscientiousness, which is like meticulous, organized versus the opposite of that. Uh, there's extroversion, introversion, you know, which is one trait. And you can imagine sometimes people are different in different situations, uh, but other times they might have certain trends. Uh, there's agreeableness or disagreeableness. And you can imagine more likely, you know, people in uh, nursing are going to be very agreeable and caring and compassionate and warm. And maybe more like managers might be more like uh, disagreeable, where they're more like able to make very difficult decisions on a regular basis. Uh, and then the last one is neuroticism. You know, there's certain people that are more prone to emotions that feel them. Uh, and, uh, and then there's um, people that are more um, on the sort of that logic side where they don't experience those emotions uh, intensely. Okay, so just if I can understand that. So then there's the psychology model, which has these five quadrants. It's a model of psychology. A model of psychology. Five uh, uh, dimensions, five dimensions. character traits. I, actually, I should, I should probably Google the, the right word, but the whole idea is that uh, there's these, these personality traits uh, that make up who you are, and they stay relatively consistent, you know, from your 20s to your 60s. All right, so we'll put that word in our description, but you, you, in the A psychology model or is that got five, and the psychiatry one that we're talking about has got four. No, so the psychiatry one, they, they talk about cluster A, B, and C personality traits. Okay. So I'm talking about, about, I'm talking about the model for personality. Okay, all right, sorry. Yeah, no, I mean, it's nothing to be sorry about. I'm, I'm like, I'm talking about different boxes, right, in, in different kinds of ways. Okay. And, and with this personality model with the, the ocean, right, or the psychology neo five-factor uh, model, uh, you can imagine how certain people would respond differently. And I think one metaphor that overlays nicely with this is this whole idea of dandelion versus orchid kids. Okay. And I don't know if you've heard those terms I've before. heard that expression. I don't know what it means. Yeah, so if you can imagine what's a dandelion like, it grows anywhere, right? It, grows yeah. anywhere. it can grow through cement, it goes on like winter or whatever, not winter, but it'll grow anywhere through anything, all that kind of stuff. Doesn't need rain, doesn't need special humidity or... Yeah, it'll find a way to live and survive and uh, spread. Yeah. Um, and orchids are beautiful, beautiful, 
I don't know what you call it, creature, I don't know what you call it over kid. But everything has to be perfect, right? Yes. The soil, the, the humidity, uh, the moisture, the lighting, yeah. the everything. Yeah, that's exactly. You've clearly heard this before. <laughs> and all I know about an orchid, that's all. So. <laughs> so it has to be perfect, right? And and then you can imagine so there there's certain people where um, they'll be fine wherever they end up. There there's other people where they, they really need that right uh, environment, right? Sure. And you can imagine, like, if you're really high in neuroticism where you feel emotion so, so, so intensely, you probably need some skills to handle it. Or if you're so introverted, it could cause problems as well, right? You won't socialize. So, for example, if you grow up and you're introverted and no one's around to help and correct, you know, or model how people can be, you might just always keep to yourself and people might think that, oh, he's rude, he doesn't care, all this kind of stuff. But if you have a parent that, that shows you, it can be very different. So imagine like, you know, you're a kid, you're five, you're an introvert, someone throws a ball at you, you ignore it, they roll the ball again at you, you ignore it. Eventually they're gonna stop wanting to play catch with you. They're not even gonna try, they're gonna be like, oh, this guy doesn't wanna play, right? But if you have like a mom or dad there that's with you and noticing, they teach you, hey, that person's playing catch with you, pick it up, you know, lob it back, play it back and forth. Yeah. All of a sudden you build those skills or character as we call it, where even if you have a certain uh, temperament, uh, you learn how to function in this, this world, whether you're high emotion, you're introvert expert, agreeable, disagreeable, all that kind of stuff. You can learn those, those other traits uh, that might balance you out in these normal social interactions. So that's the second part of it. Okay. The third part is pure behavioral. Okay. Right? So, and what do we think about when we think about behavior? We think about an antecedent behavior consequence. So, for example, you know, I might have some kind of uh, trigger where I'm like watching TV and an ad for Coca Cola comes on. Um, I all of a sudden like go get that Coca Cola, you know, maybe I drive to the store and go pick it up, then I drink it, and then I get that rewarding uh, sensation that's there, um, there as well. Do you maybe want to explain what an antecedent is? Yeah, so. It's the thing that happens before okay. a behavior, right? So it could be like, you know, um, uh, like say the behavior is picking up the phone to call the floor. Maybe I get a page right before that I, um, I, I do that in some way. And so the page get, was the antecedent. Yeah, that to, would be the antecedent the for that, that behavior, okay. right? But when you, if I call the um, page the behavior, Right, the antecedent would be whatever happened with the the nurse or the doctor before that they triggered, made that call. Triggered the page. Yeah, okay. that, that's exactly it. Okay. You know, and and so when we think about it in terms of like say like food stuff, you know, maybe I'm a little bit hungry or maybe I'm lonely or tired, and all of a sudden, you know, like I'm feeling that way. I'm like, oh, I want to feel better. I go get the coke or I go get like. Um, a candy bar or whatever that is, and then I feel good for, for a little bit. Yeah, like I wasn't hungry until you mentioned cashews, then, uh, then all it is about uh, cashews, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, I guess, yeah, that, that, would, that would fit with it as well. Uh, and um, what also drives behavior is we have these natural drives, right? So we have a natural drive for food, we have a natural drive for sex, we have a natural drive for sleep. And, and what happens with addiction or substance, sometimes it hijacks that reward system where it's all that we care about and it's all that we think about. So every antecedent uh, leads to that behavior, right? Whatever, whatever that is. And when you look at trying to shift that piece... Could include I'm getting stressed out, you know, somebody's... My wife is bragging on me about one thing or another. Yeah, That could lead to, to me exactly. wanting to use substances. It that's could be, exactly. you know, I got in trouble at work. It, you know, it could be any list of things, and they're all leading to this one, Absolutely. This one thing. Absolutely. You know, and, and if, even if you think uh, to certain, like, suicidal behavior, right, where people self-harm, there was something that happened before that maybe brought it out. Right. Uh, or if it's, like, where... Um, uh, someone's yelling at somebody, maybe someone said something, or maybe they were uh, angry at work, they come home, they kick their cat, I don't know, I mean, I'm just giving... So right. all these antecedents for some people, like per perhaps for someone who's suicidal, or for somebody who's struggling with addiction or substance use, they all could be leading to that same, that same uh, outcome, or the same next step, is that... Yeah, yeah, th that's exactly it, you know, and, uh, and it's uh, when we, I mean, we were talking about this a while back around first wave psychotherapies that were all behavioral, that's what it was, it's like, what's the actual behavior? What happens then, what happens after that, what happens that, and what does it lead to? Uh, and, and it also guides some of the therapies that we look at, right, in terms of how to change that behavior. Part of us has to think uh, behaviorally. So it sounds like that makes sense. Yeah, for you. it does, absolutely, yeah. And so... Right now we've covered there's a disease, 
there are certain kind of temperament or dimensions or personality traits that people have. Uh, and, and the last part, there's a behavioral component. So what are we missing in terms of understanding the person? That's we're a missing, good question. We're missing their life story. Their life story. What if they, did they grow up in a small town? They grow up in a big town. Was their mom present? Was their mom absent? Did How did their trauma? environment affect them? Is that, yep. is that yeah, what that we're dealing with? How yeah. did their upbringing, how did their... Yeah, what, what beliefs do they have about themselves in the world because of that upbringing? Uh, what what's kinds the of... the nurture, uh, what, what's the... There's an expression. Nature, nurture. Nat nature, nurture, right? Which is, is that is that along the same thoughts? Yeah, that, I mean, this would be more, I think, along the... Uh, I guess the nurture lines, right? Yeah, like is it is it the you know is you know when you have what happens in the environment when you separate out twins, for example, sometimes, right? Where they you know and they they raise in completely different uh, environments. How 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 do they do they come out the same? Do they come? Yeah, out? yeah. So so in those cases, I think the dimension part. You know, when I talked about that ocean openness, conscientious, that stuff likely would be similar in some way, uh, but um, the life story would be very different. So this fourth quadrant would be very different, right? Because uh, one of them may have had a nurturing. Parent. One of them may have had an absent parent. One of them may have success in school. One of them may have had success in sports. One of them may have yeah. failure in something. Other had failure in something else. And so we're shaped by these uh, these experiences, right? And so their hope is that by having a disease, having the um, uh, dimensions in terms of psychological traits, uh, having patterns of uh, behavior, and having your life story, you're really getting a feel for the full individual. And for me, it's especially helpful because it helps guide my treatment recommendations for the person in front of me. So when I do an assessment, I try to figure out what a psychiatrist say they have depression or anxiety or whatever they have, what those treatments would be. But I also think about, given what I've heard, what treatment would help. Uh, and obviously, I mean, MI is more of a tool of engagement, motivational interviewing. But for people with personality disorders or borderline personality, we think about dialectical behavior therapy. So dialectical behavior therapy works on both. It works on the temperament uh, and it works on the behaviors that they're doing. And it's very explicit in terms of how it does it. CRA, which is a community reinforcement approach, it really works on the behaviors you're seeing. And part of it is also altering the um, environment. When you look at cognitive behavior therapy or post-traumatic stress disorder treatment, it's working on the life story component of it. You know, in terms of what are the experiences they've had, what have they changed their values, what have they changed their, their beliefs. And this book here uh, by um, Chisholm, C-H-I-S-O-L-M, this uh, systematic psychiatric evaluation, takes this, this model and then goes through a whole bunch of cases talking about how to understand it. And, and our, our good friend and mentor, Tim Guimond, is using this model in terms of assessing people at HQ at Toronto okay. and trying to understand how people are and what they what they need. So this would be is this a useful model for uh, just psychiatrists? Or is this useful? Is there I guess there's useful lessons in what we're talking about for everybody. But are you suggesting that that uh, this is something that everybody should be doing when they're seeing a patient for the first time if they're Yeah. So I'm not sure if everyone should be doing this when they see a patient for the first uh, time. Uh, I don't do it explicitly, so what does that mean? I do it more sort of in my uh, mind as I'm trying to understand is this person's temperament, is this a repetitive behavior, is there a disease that needs a treatment, uh, do they need like psychiatric medications, uh, do they need specific psychotherapies, um, I, I, that's where, where I use it. I don't do it explicitly in terms of the uh, dimensions, maybe eventually I will if I have a proper setup and screening and all that kind of stuff, but for me, I mean, it's just, it's more, um, it's more structured and explicit in terms of trying to understand the person and knowing what I'm trying to target. If someone I, I work with has been an introvert their whole life, maybe I need to teach them uh, skills on how to interact with others, social skills, that kind of stuff. Maybe someone's been going back to Going back to when the, there wasn't a parent there, kind of throwing, showing them how to catch, throw the ball at maybe they need to learn how to throw the ball back or, yeah. or what's happening there. Yeah, that's exactly Help it. Help them understand that interaction. Yeah, and then if they're so extroverted, right, like where they're always like interacting and around others, all that kind of stuff, maybe teaching them how to feel comfortable in their own skin. If someone's really, really high emotions, you know, all the time, anything, the emotions come up intensely, maybe there's value in helping them figure out, you know, how to feel those emotions, but also channel them in a way that allows you to function socially, function at work, all that kind of stuff. And if you're someone that's like, doesn't have those intense emotions, how do we help you connect or participate in a way where you can almost seem more human, 
Okay. You know, if you're if you're very disagreeable and you're like, nope, 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 do this, this, this. Maybe there's a find a way you can be learn how learn how to frame it so that people who are seeing you're acknowledging all the different sides of the story, right? Okay, and makes so, sense. Yeah, and, and so the, there's um, there, there's that piece, and so I, I just think it's a, I, I think it's a really nice uh, model. It's something that I don't use explicitly enough, but it helps me decide what does this person need. Do they need behavioral skills? Do they need trauma treatment? Do they just not have these skills? So it's not like they have a destructive behavior, but their 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 baseline state is a certain way, right? And or do they have like a bipolar spectrum or all this kind of stuff? With addiction, it's a bit tricky. So the way that they sort of frame addiction, like, you know, with methadone, you would think it would fit in the disease model, but they, they actually would put that in the behavioral piece, right? Because when people are using uh, opiates, what's happening, they're either having cravings or they're having withdrawal symptoms, right? And they're saying the, the methadone is working on the antecedent, so it's less likely to cause that behavior. So someone having the, someone being treated with methadone is, is under the behavioral quadrant in, in as opposed model. to... As opposed disease. to considering a disease or an illness. Uh, yeah, in this model. But I mean, I think, uh, you know, with over time, there's always discussions and we, people figure it out in some way. Now, does this relate, is there a list of questions that you, were, you would ask in this? Is there a list of predetermined questions that you're going to go off of? Or does this book teach you that? Yeah, I, I think it, it covers some of it, but I, I don't think there's explicit questions to go through. I mean, I really just do the psychiatric uh, assessment. And for me, the psychiatric assessment includes uh, addiction. Okay. Right, And so I'll go through my assessment, I'll try to figure out does a person have a bipolar spectrum disorder, a psychotic disorder, all that kind of stuff, I'll put that in the disease. Uh, in the personal history, uh, that's where I'll get some of the temperament kind of uh, things or the dimensional kinds of uh, things. And then when I go through their typical day, good days, bad days, when they use, when they don't use, then I get some of the behaviors that are there. So I do it a little bit uh, indirectly, you know, so I don't do it as structured as I could. And, and then when I get to the assessment, um, I try to have it semi-structured. So when I started doing this work, I would just sort of have a conversation. But I find that when you have a conversation, you sometimes miss key points. And medical legal, you have to cover certain things to make something an assessment. And so I always try to have it structured. I have like um, identifying data, uh, what brought them here, um, main concern. I have them go through their typical day. I just love the typical day question. Uh, and, uh, and then I try to get a narrative around what's been going on lately that, that made them in this state. Could be the last week, last month, last couple of years, depending on whatever it is. For the substance use, I'm much more specific. So I figure out when they started using, uh, day, like weekly, daily, what the drug did for them, what that pattern was, uh, what the harms were uh, around it. And then if they've had a treatment, I try to figure out what they liked about it. Did it help? Were they still using? And if they had periods of sobriety, I try to get them to talk about what their life was like, you know, when they're sober. So they can almost, or what their life was like if they've had successes, how they're able to get those uh, successes. So what I was getting at with my questions, for example, as a, as a case manager, one of the tools that we use is, is called the GAINS assessment yeah. from CAMH. Yeah. And that's a, it takes about 90 minutes as well. It could take up to two hours if, uh, depending on how, oh, wow. uh, how, how difficult it is for the, for the, the client, because it brings up a lot of, it could bring up a lot of past traumas in their life, answering some of these questions. Uh, ask about, you know, kind of uh, sex, first sexual experiences and, and all, every, every possible, uh, every possible thing that could be, you know, uh, traumatic for somebody, it seems to, it seems to touch on. Um, so that, but it's a, it's a very, you know, well structured, you know, kind of uh, assessment. Right, and and then you're tabulating it all, and it comes out with you know a report and all that. So that's why I didn't know is this something as structured as that? It sounds like not so much. Yeah, I mean, I, I just do a psychiatric uh, assessment, and then okay. I think about this uh, model. Well, just for someone who doesn't maybe doesn't someone. know what a psychiatric assessment is, that's why I guess I'm asking from that perspective. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's definitely not as structured as the gain. There's yeah. a lot of room for flexibility. There are psychological or psychiatric assessments that are structured yeah. uh, that have been done in different areas that don't have to be administered by a psychiatrist and they cover a lot of the uh, the bases. I still have to look through the, the gain. I've never gone through it in detail. Maybe it's worthwhile to go yeah, through the well, training. Yeah, maybe we can do that at uh, one of our other sessions, talk about the gain. Yeah, no, I think that'd be great. And and the, the things that, that I was sharing a little bit uh, when I was going through some of those questions around what I ask, when I ask, how I ask it, that's sort of what's involved in that psych assessment uh, piece. Okay. And uh, maybe um, maybe one thing that we can do is we can share like a blank template or something. For yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, I'm, I'd like to see it. Like a, yeah. I'd be curious. Maybe other people would be curious. Yeah. 
So yeah, so that's the, the this four quadrant perspectives of psychiatry um, awesome. model, and for me, it's it's how I try to understand uh, people that I that I see. Although I don't do it explicitly, I do it sort of implicitly through my regular um, assessment. Uh, and and for when I'm in an addiction clinic, uh, I can't go through all the questions because a lot of times you just want people to feel comfortable and come back. And from the psychiatric standpoint, I get more, but it still takes time to sort of tease out some of these things. And part of me wants to have a way to do it explicitly, right? So have people fill out certain skills. So I'll know if they're an introvert or an extrovert, right? Or so I'll know if they're prone to high emotions or um, uh, not experiencing high emotions, that kind of stuff. Um, so at the end of this, you would know if somebody could be potentially a borderline or, or, or bipolar or that sort of thing. You'd, you'd have some indicators of some of those things? Yeah, I mean, that comes out through the general psychiatric assessment because you have a list of like 5 to 10 or 15 questions that you might ask okay. uh, and try to tease that um, that out, right? And so that would come with or without this this model. Okay. Right? And this model, the only reason I teach it is because I want people to start thinking more broadly. Oh, not like, oh, you're using alcohol, let's get you to stop. Oh, you've got depression, let's treat your depression. No, but let's try to understand somebody a little bit more more broadly uh, so we can really figure out how to get them to reduce the harm or have the life they want or whatever that might be. Cool. Awesome.